Welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight uh, to hear from Li Shen Yu, producer director of Plague at the Golden Gate, in conversation with filmmaker Larry Tong. I'm JT Takagi of Third World Newsreel, a progressive media center that prioritizes media by and about people of color and social justice issues. We do this through production, educational distribution, exhibition, training, and events like this. This event is also sponsored by the Documentary Forum at CCNY, a center in the City College of New York dedicated to supporting documentary film and nonfiction storytelling through multi-platform media. This event is also co-sponsored by the Asian American Asian Research Institute at CUNY, ARI. It's a university-wide scholarly research and resource center that focuses on policies and issues that affect Asians and Asian Americans. I want first, though, to have you join me in acknowledging that we are on the unceded territory of the Lenni Lenape, Canarsi, Shinnecock, and Muncie peoples. We acknowledge and challenge the harm that continues to be inflicted upon indigenous and people of color communities here and abroad, which is why we all need to be part of the struggle for rights, equality, and justice. Some housekeeping notes. We're keeping attendees muted, but welcome your questions and comments in the chat. I'll be doing short intros, but you'll see longer information about our guests in the chat. Um, I'm happy to introduce Li Shen Yu, as soon as I can find her there. And um, an Emmy winning editor and the producer director of Plague at the Golden Gate, an American experience film. She'll be talking to Larry Tung in a minute, but right now she's going to set up a short clip from the film that we're going to show you. Hi, Lishan. Hi, JT. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Third World Newsreel and Doc at CCNY. Um, Plague at the Golden Gate uh, tells the story of a very little known chapter of our history where the most feared disease, the bubonic plague, came to the US. Um, and when it, the first case was diagnosed in San Francisco's Chinatown in 1900, the Asian community was immediately targeted for blame. And so two federal doctors were sent to San Francisco to try to contain the plague. Uh, the first doctor is named Joseph Kenyon, uh, who diagnosed first, first case. Um, the clip you will see will show San Francisco's uh, denial of this plague and its early response. So uh, take a look and we will talk afterwards. Thanks. Most San Franciscans didn't care. They couldn't be bothered with the death of a faceless stranger in Chinatown, especially given widespread beliefs that whites were immune. As for city leaders, while they refused to accept Kenyon's diagnosis, they did agree that what they called the Chinese problem needed to be contained. They didn't really understand how the bubonic plague was transmitted to people but they knew if it occurred in a city, it would be in one area. And so the public health approach was to find the focus and go in there and do whatever you could to get rid of the disease. The moment Mayor Phelan declared, Asiatic infections are a constant menace to San Francisco's public health. 75 health inspectors and dozens of policemen, armed with sledgehammers and axes, descended on an unsuspecting Chinatown. They smashed down doors, ransacked homes, stole brazenly, and beat anyone who stood up to them. They were subjected to plague measures, which included torching of belongings. They would bring in smudge pots of sulfur and fumigate a building. If you were a merchant selling fine silks or ceramics, it would spoil your goods. So these measures, which were crude and discriminatory and not very effective, 
frightened the populace. People were not eager to report a case of sickness in their home. In 1900, at the time of the bubonic plague, my great-grandfather had a business called the Pacific Fruit Packing Company. And my family lived above the cannery on Stockton Street in Chinatown. They went to church where Ng Poon Chu was the assistant pastor. And that's how, when he started a newspaper, my great-grandfather helped him fund the Jung Sai Yat Po. And in Chinatown, they would post some of the newspapers on the walls. So the Chinese knew exactly what was going on. Ning Pyun Chu and his newspaper documented what the deeply felt fears and concerns were of Chinese laborers, how they distrusted Western medical authority, how they feared what was going to happen to them from a Chinese perspective. Alas, why should Chinatown's good name depend on the life and death of a monkey? We don't know whether they are rooting for Chinatown or the monkey. Zhong Se Yat Bo Daily. Nine days after Wong Chuk King's death, Kenyon confirmed three more cases, all within Chinatown. Kenyon had feared such an outbreak all along knowing that even a handful of cases could explode exponentially into a national epidemic within weeks. So, as I said, Lesion Yu's Emmy-winning editor and producer director of The Plague at the Golden Gate, Larry Tung is an award-winning documentary filmmaker and media educator and an associate professor in the Department of Performing and Fine Arts at York College. Welcome, Larry. And I'm going to let you two now talk. And we're going to have you talk, and then uh, in another half hour, we'll have questions from the audience, who, and everyone can post in the chat. Thank you. Hi, Li Xing. Hi, Larry. Hi, Thank Ryan. you for being here tonight. Yeah, it was uh, such a wonderful film, and it's a very important film. Uh, so I wanted to start by asking you, um, how did this, uh, what inspired you to make this film? How did it come about? Well, actually, the story came to me, you know, as I was saying earlier, this is a story that's not very well known. And I actually did not know this history myself. Uh, American Experience had uh, optioned a book by David K. Randall called uh, Black Death at the Golden Gate. And they were looking for uh, Cameo George, the first uh, African-American executive producer of uh, American Experience, understood that the story needed to be told, you know, very much with the Chinese-Americans perspective. So she reached out to the wonderful organization, Center for Asian American Media, Cam in San Francisco. And I worked with Stephen Gong and Don Yang on the Chinese Exclusion Act documentary. So they put me forward and I'm extremely grateful and, and kudos to Cameo for supporting uh, our choices. And we were able to put together a predominantly Asian American team to, to make this film. And um, so uh, as I began to research the story, I just seemed like it was an important story to tell because it was so resonant with the experiences that we are we, we are currently living through, you know, with COVID-19, um, the uh, rising Asian hate crime, the finger pointing, the blaming, needing to, when you're faced with an uh, feared unknown, that seems to be the knee jerk re response, you know, who can we blame, you know, and um, so this history very much has uh, uh, just, you know, almost 
um, as we're making the film, is it almost seems as if the story is happening just outside our window. It's it's pretty uncanny that way, um, and yeah, yeah, because um, I was just thinking because we're still in the middle of the pandemic. It's, the pandemic is not over yet, so I was just curious. Um, when exactly did you um, start working on it? Was it before the pandemic started or in the middle of it? It was actually in the middle of it. I, I, we started, um, I got my producer, James Q. Chan on at the end of December of 2020. And the film came out uh, May of 2022. So it was in a span of maybe 14, 15 months to turn around this film, two hour film uh, about a pandemic during a pandemic. And so there were obvious challenges. Um, a lot of the archives were shut down and closed. We were lucky that um, San Francisco Public Library was open and James had uh, a, a deep relationship with them uh, and they were open to us. Um, so that, that was uh, a, a crucial link for us. Um, we were also able to just reach out to the community and found um, descendants, you know, uh, of uh, Liu Hing, who was uh, one of the leading merchants of Chinatown in 1900, his great grandson, uh, we were in touch with, and um, Harry Chuck, whose mother was born in 1900 in Chinatown, and um, also the descendants of one of the doctor, uh, Joseph Kenyon, um, and all families were have lovingly preserved and held on to documents and artifacts from back then. And you know, for me, having worked in history all this time, these documents are are just really. I find I I often say this that they are they become the stars of the film. You know, it's through them that we're able to tell the story. It, they are uh, they in fact live through this history, so to speak. So, using them to bring the story alive is is a crucial component. Mm -hmm. And what what are some of the important messages do you want your your audience to walk away with? You know, I, I think for me is that you know history matters. Um, the more we study history, the more we see how you know when you forget it, you tend to repeat it, as we see often. I mean, this, you know, the, the racialization and politicization of this disease um, we see happening today, you know, instead of uh, understanding the science, following the science, we kind of delay proactive responses uh, because we politicize the situation. Um, that happened in 1900. We see it happening now. Um, and I think, you know, to understand that history can, if we're smart enough, can teach us, right? And I, I, I think to understand that, uh, you know, this history at the time, um, the mistrust that the community had with the authority was really deep. And that in itself has a history. The Chinese Exclusion Act was passed in 1882, which was not, so the people in San Francisco at the time lived through that history. So, and, and that, his, that passage of the act begat one of the most violent period in our history because in in effect it seemed like the, a federal law that banned a group of people naming a group of people to ban gave permission 
to people to act out their basis instinct, um, which is something that we are seeing and feeling right now. So I, I, I think for me that, you know, to understand that racism is historical, it's structural, it's built over time. And so it will also take time to dismantle. And, you know, when we have a deeper understanding of that, I think it would help, uh, help us at the present, you know, to ground ourselves and to understand how we might want to proceed that. And I think it just um, speaks, to, this really speaks to the importance of teaching Asian American history in our schools, because Asian American history is American history. And even uh, for me, you know, I'm very embarrassed to say that I didn't know anything about uh, this historic event myself. And you were uh, mentioning the, um, the Chinese Exclusion Act. Uh, uh, so you also made a film. You also co-directed a film uh, about that. So can you, uh, that was back in 2017? Yeah, can you uh, talk about how that project came to you? Uh, that that project came about, you know, I had worked with Rick Burns for a long time and we did a film about the West and how the West was lost and won, depending on whose perspective you took. And uh, we came across the incident on the Snake River where 30 some Chinese miners were just slaughtered. Um, and it was at that point in time, it's, you know, we were doing a history about the West and we did not know this incident. And so it was suddenly this sort of, why is it, you know? So we talked about making a film about that, but, you know, um, life intervened and we did other projects until the New York Historical Society uh, reached out to us because they had wanted to do an exhibition about the Chinese Exclusion Act and wanted to know if you wanted to do a film concurrently. And we just jumped on that opportunity. That was in 2013. And so as we were fundraising and developing the project, you know, 2016, building up to 2016, and uh, once again, uh, events outside our window was happening that so mirrored the Chinese Exclusion Act history where, you know, Chinese uh, were just, uh, the, the, the virulence, racial virulent at the time and uh, finger pointing and blaming and, you know, calling history fake and all of that is is just continue. It, it's been ongoing for now many, many years. And um, it just seems to uh, continue. And I think part of that is also because, you know, we, we don't we don't understand that this is a continuing um, process that uh, we need to understand and so we know understand how to fight it and th those two films are just so powerful and so important for all of us to watch so for those of you who have not seen uh, uh the plague at the golden gate it's still streaming on pbs website so again um i want to say you know uh, as a filmmaker myself i understand uh that media is such a powerful educational tool and you've been in this business for so long so I'm just uh, curious about uh, how your um, filmmaking uh, career how your journey started can you tell us a little bit about that yeah you know I I was an art major um, and had a little crisis thinking oh painting how is that going to help the world you know, and um, so I kind of, although I don't believe that now, but at the time, I, I, my young self thought that uh, I need to get into 
into something that could reach a wider audience. So uh, sort of blindly, I found myself in film school and kind of the rest is history. And, um, and at that time, you know, as an aspiring young filmmaker, I, I was really trying to uh, learn the craft and, you know, also, of course, um, did not uh, understand history that much. And um, I feel very fortunate to have fallen into historical documentary because I think it's really an important, important um, uh, a venue for, for, as you were saying, education and broadening our understanding of who we are and who we, you know, aspire to be and, and how we might get there. Um, so, you know, um, just over time, learning the craft of it uh, and learning how invaluable uh, the filmmaking team is uh, really, you know, I'm so grateful, like for this project, I have this just amazing, was able to dig into the deep well of extremely talented Asian American filmmakers. You know, JT did sound for me, you know, a wonderful producer who, uh, James Q. Chan, I had a Japanese American editor, Nikki Watanabe Milmore. I had a uh, Korean American writer, Suzanne Kim, you know, Filipino uh, American narrator, uh, so on and on. So it, it's just been like a, a, an amazing experience. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I agree. I think um, representation is, uh, re representation matters both um, in front of the camera and behind the camera, because when you are the creator, you have the control of your your storytelling. So I'm wondering, um, when you started, uh, were there a lot of Asian Americans involved in the filmmaking business? Uh, not a lot. There were, there, they, you know, they were there, like JT was one of them. Um, you know, I, for the longest time, it, um, some of you may know Jing Chan, who is like an amazing editor and, you know, is back so many independent uh, Asian American filmmakers. Um, for the longest time, we seem to be the only uh, Asian American editors, you know, um, but, you know, fortunately um, that, that field is expanding um, there are more and more of us, you know, being not only in front of a camera, but also behind. And um, it, it um, for the young filmmakers out there, you know, do not be disheartened. You know, we, our, our, our time is, our time is here. And, you know, this, um, it, you know, we, 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 it, it is our time, I feel, to like, just be, be bold. Um, yeah, I, but I remember... traditionally, you know, within the Asian American community, you know, we're um, often encouraged to go to other professional fields like law or medicine, you know, it sounds like a, a cliche, but it is a reality. How would you, what would you say to um, Chinese American or Asian American parents about um, uh, allowing their their children to um, to pursue a career in the arts. Yeah, well, I you know I have to say I, I feel I'm I'm really blessed for my parents. You know, uh, of their generation, they were very open. I think part of that also had to do with that. I'm the youngest daughter, so I was given a lot of latitude to kind of do what I what, uh, you know, I follow my, my passion. And I think, you know, um, that it is really um, 
filmmaking, especially now, it, it is it is a way that really can reach a wide audience. You know, um, as we can see, even in documentary and in 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 fiction and not nonfiction, both. And it is really an honorable profession. You know, I think traditionally it has been viewed as sort of lesser, but it really is not. I mean, if you look at the work I do and all my colleagues do, it, it, we bring, we, we tell deep stories about, you know, our aspiration as a community and um, there there is a lot to be gained from that a lot of honor in there and, and a lot of respect can come from it and do come from it and for this project uh you are the director for mm -hmm. um for uh, uh plague at the golden gate and i know you had a very a long working relationship as an editor and also as a co-director uh, with Rick Burns. So can um, so how do you feel about this project that now you're, um, this is your own baby? Yeah, well, you know, it, it, it's at once nerve wracking and exhilarating because, you know, I, I, I tell this oftentimes when I'm an editor, you know, I will watch footage and be like, oh, why don't I did the camera move a little bit this way and hold on there just right, you know? And I would often complain. And so now I, I hold that rein, right? <laughs> and so, so that is nerve wracking, but it is ex exhilarating because I can, I can choose my team. I can choose the way I want to tell it. I, you know, in, in, in this film is very much, I saw it as a medical mystery. So I can choose how to express that, you know, um, and um, using the archives, uh, archives, you know, in the filmmaking process, in historical documentary, especially in 1900, there are not a lot of images available. It's not that rich in visuals. So I was able to decide how visually to tell this story to enhance the kind of the medical mystery, you know, uh, using kind of place-based storytelling methods, you know, San Francisco. When you think of San Francisco, it's fog and shrouded, and that kind of evokes the mystery. Uh, and so, you know, those were a lot of uh, techniques that I, I was able to freely uh, used to tell this story. And do you think your um, your editing experience had helped? Because I know in the beginning of your career, you uh, worked as a camera operator as well, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. and then you uh, later you chose editing. So you've been an mm -hmm. editor for a long time. You won an Emmy Award for it. So your uh, does your editing experience help you um, become a, a director? Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it does because editing is really about storytelling. And so, you know, the director's job is to find a way to tell the story. Um, you know, we, we, for, for this particular project, we, we were lucky to have three books that we could base the story on, but still in the end, it's how do you, how do you bring the story alive? How do you, uh, connected to the audience today, you know, and so, um, however, I still very much needed my own editor to help me decipher the story, because as a director, you suddenly, everything seems to be important. And I needed my editor to tell me, no, 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 no. That's really, we know that already. You don't have to include it. So it's really this collaborative effort, you know, that is uh, crucial every step of the way, along the way. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so this event uh, is also supported by uh, CCNY. So 
Um, there are probably some of our students are, are uh, watching this. So I'm wondering for um, aspiring young filmmakers, what advice do you have for them? You know, this, this was something I, I heard an, another director say, um, is to, you know, all along your career, you will hear many no's. You know, people will say, no, you can't do this. No, you're not the right person. No this, no that, is to don't take no for an answer. And especially don't, don't say no to yourself, you know, have, have, you know, trust in your, trust, trust in yourself, trust in your own passion and just go for it. It's out there for all of us to take, you know, um, and, and to, to, to really, I, I think that key to, to trust in your passion, to trust in your own belief and, and go for it. You know, you will stumble. We all stumble. I stumble, you know, but in stumbling, you learn and it just builds up your strength and your techniques and your craftsmanship and, and your storytelling abilities. Um, so okay. don't give up. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, so, uh, as a as Asian American, I have to ask you um, in uh, in in your future project, uh, is there anything that you would like to work on that's related to um, Asian American community? Well, um, right now I am uh, developing. You know, I have a number of things percolating, but the the, the one project that is is coming to the fore that I would love to do is the story of James Wang Hao, who is a premier Hollywood cinematographer in the 30s and 40s and into the 50s, um, whose films you might know, but you may not know his story, that his his personal story so much. And, and um, it is, you know, he was nominated at least uh, for 10 Academy Awards, won two for um, HUD is one of them, starring, um, um, I'm blanking out, my recall is pretty poor these days, um, but, you know, it, it, it's an amazing story, and he was, um, uh, married to a wonderful writer named Sonora Bab, and uh, their marriage had to be behind closed doors because of anti-miscegenation laws in Cal um, and uh, was not officialized until the laws were repealed in uh, 1948. So for 10 years, they were um, kind of had to hide their status. Um, uh, both fascinating characters uh, that live through a period um, of our history that I, I, I think it's just fascinating. So it's- uh, I can't wait to, uh, for that, that project. Anything uh, that you're working on right now? Uh, not, not per particularly right now, I'm just helping um, on a couple of projects um, as, as editors. Um, but uh, let's see, uh, one, one is um, by a colleague of mine uh, called Men from Potential uh, by Qi Xuan Liang. And she is an editor, and it's about an uh, art dealer who supported emerging artists in the 70s through the 90s. And another film uh, called Hidden Wounds by Richard Liu about um, 
caregivers. Um, so it sounds like you're doing a lot of collaboration with Asian American filmmakers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That that um, I I find a lot of joy and and fun in doing that. You know, because uh, having having gone through decades of 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 learning the craft it's uh i i i feel it's almost a responsibility for me to you know pass on what i have learned to young filmmakers so you know uh, any young filmmakers out there i welcome you to reach out to me for whatever questions or needs you have i i am always open to that oh that's that's great i'm sure a lot of people will take advantage of that. Thank you so much. Now, um, we have a bunch of, uh, we have a lot of audience today, so uh, maybe we can take a few questions. So here uh, we have a question from Tida. What were most difficult parts of your story that you had to let your editor cut? <laughs> uh, well, I, I I think the hardest part was, um, I mean, the hardest part of the story altogether is the complexity of it. And we'd, ha we'd have to streamline the story, you know, so that it could be more, uh, 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 so you, you understand it uh, more clearly. You know, there is a whole level of sort of um, the economic story behind, you know, the, the denial of this health crisis was partly because, you know, San Francisco did not want to lose business because if you said plague existed in my city, you will lose business. So there, that 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 uh, that whole complexity, uh, the the deep complexity of that, I think we didn't delve into, but you know we wanted to, uh, but I I think it does come through, um, the fine grain uh, detail of it, well, we had to sort of uh, uh, set aside um, some of the other sort of deeper sto personal stories of the two doctors uh, or even of um, Liu Hing, the Chinese merchant who was key in the founding of the Cheng Sai Yapao news local uh, newspaper and who had, uh, after the earthquake, had a large part in helping the community, uh, some of those detailed backstory had to be um, streamlined. So, so it's, uh, but otherwise, I, you know, I, 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 I feel pretty sure that all the complex strands were, were able to be told. Mm -hmm. And I especially love the narration um, by Leia Salonga. How did you get her? Well, it was by chance. Our um, our uh, executive in charge, uh, Yuri Chung, who's Korean American, had uh, happened to have worked on uh, something for Leia Salongas, um, and so she was in touch with her agent. So we were standing around myself, hey, oh, she has such a beautiful voice. So Yuri said, well, let me just try. So she she reached out to the agent and and um, God bless her. She jumped on the project. You know, um, I, I think so many of uh, the voices, we had Perry Young do the voice of Chong Sai Yapao. We had um, uh, Joel De La Fuente do the voice of Joseph Kenyon and Josh Hamilton do the voice of um, Rupert Blue. You know, these are people who normally we would not be able to afford, but they all came on 
on board and it's just pretty pretty amazing i really feel uh, um, i lucked out <laughs> <laughs> and we have another question uh from xin chen uh what do you think a good work relationship should be during the post-production process and how do you control your tone in the story while the editors contribute theirs yeah, it, it, it really is a collaborative effort. Um, you know, it, of course, you set the tone by communicating with your team, you know, um, with in post production, it's very much, um, you know, COVID, I think, made it slightly difficult because everybody works remotely i think if you're you're if you're able to be in a room with your editor you know that process could be much more free flowing um but i you know god bless my editor mickey she was like from the get-go she said Lishin, you know let's have a phone call every morning so every day we talked you know, since we were not able to be in the same room, we talked sometimes the conversation uh, would go on for like 90 minutes. Uh, sometimes it's only 10, 15 minutes for a quick check-in, but it's, it, it's that, um, that sort of getting into each other's mind is really where you want to um, get to that point where uh, and also to because i filmed footage uh these setups you know where the document what we understand as two-dimensional documents i set it into three-dimensional spaces so that to bring the power of these you know, 100 year old documents to life. And just the way I filmed them, and the the things that I filmed to convey to the editor, you know, how I had imagined them to be used, so that they would, um, so that, and that really sets the tone. And also music is another component of set, setting the tone of uh, picking the, 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 the cues, temp cues, and then, of course, then working with the um, composer who is uh, Vivek Madala, uh, Indian American. So, you know, it, it, um, collaboration is always key. You cannot make a film by yourself. Or at least, at least a a, a two-hour documentary is is not something one person can accomplish. Yes, and we have a, a question from Romy. Uh, has has have you seen the film uh, Six, which is about six Chinese uh, maritime men on the Titanic? Oh no, I have not. I would love to. Mm -hmm. where, where can I see it? Well, um, if Romy has the, the, uh, the information, please post it in the chat. And we, uh, and JT has a question actually. Could you talk about the archive research? Did you have an archival producer and the choice to do recreation, uh, recreations? Right. Uh, we we did have a archival producer who you know uh, I sort of like from from the get go there are certain things I know we wanted and so we set off the producer to do it but I think along the way a, a, a quite a bit of the research was actually done by um, James Chan our producer because as we delve into the story. He also remarkably, because the National Archive was closed, and but he found someone who had done prior research there and was able to 
you know, build a, a relationship with, uh, and we were able to access this prior uh, research. And, you know, the recreation w was key. As I was saying earlier, you know, I, I, I find such um, power in these historical documents that I, I always, you know, from, from the Chinese Exclusion Act onwards, I always try to film them in such a way to bring out their power to you know set them in a uh, situation that is of the time period uh, we were also able to bruce kwan liu hing's great-grandson so lovingly preserved all his paperwork um and you know so a lot of the chinese settings that you see uh, in the clip that we saw uh, with the Chinese artifacts, you know, the clothing and the embroidered shoes and uh, the, the photographs were all uh, from Bruce Kwan's uh, archive. So the recreation um, were really uh, to tell the story, you know, the Chinese community story. There are not that many pictures, you, you know, uh, for example, uh, there was a protest. There were the court cases that the Chinese fought back against the unjust treatment. Um, so we had to really think what, what, what were the, uh, story components that needed visual representation. Um, so we were able to, through community contacts, reach out to two um, family association who has for the first time opened their, their doors to allow us to film there. Um, you know, the, and this story suggests what those recreation needed to be. We filmed on Angel Island. Uh, the buildings that you see in Angel Island were in fact the buildings that uh, Joseph Kenyon and the doctors uh, lived in at the time. They're now repurposed, but, um, we were able to film the fog and shrouded Angel Island to connote the mystery of the plague um, disease at the time because it was not understood how it was spread, if it can, can be contained or how it can be contained and if it would explode exponentially. So the, the, the fear was there and the mystery was there. And to understand this mysterious bacteria, uh, I right away thought of the kind of amoeba-like water sparkles uh, to suggest the kind of elusiveness of this disease and the fluidity of the disease. So uh, much of that, um, uh, recreation was really stems from the story, you know, what the story suggests and uh, imagining what it must feel like, what it must sound like, what it must look like. So all that is instructive to the kind of recreation that we, we went for. Um, wow. Okay. Uh, do we have any more questions from the audience? If, if not, well, I'll bring JT back. I want to thank you both, Lee Shen Yu and Larry Tung, for being in conversation with us about this really great film. For all of you who have not seen it yet, please go to the PBS website and watch it. Um, and uh, 
I also want to thank the Asian American and Asian Research Institute at CUNY for being a co-sponsor for tonight. Um, I forgot to mention them at the beginning, so I'm mentioning them now. Um, and we hope all of you will join us for our upcoming seminars. Uh, next week we're hosting four indie filmmakers who are all in production and post-production with various views on the landscape of production, finance, and distribution at this point. It's called post-pandemic filmmaking. And we have more things coming up in October, including an augmented reality workshop and Byron Hurt talking about his film Hazing. So stay tuned by signing up for our newsletter. Thank you both again for speaking tonight. Thank you, Li Shen, for a really great film. And uh, thank you, Larry, for uh, speaking and carrying on the conversation with us and for all your film work as well. So everybody, thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.